to put your theology through a bit of a ringer, I would say being a sinner is a prerequisite to being a Christian. Yeah, everyone's like scratching their head, right? It's a prerequisite because how do you become a Christian? You acknowledge, you confess, and you repent that you have sin in your life and you need a savior, and it is by placing your faith in Jesus Christ that we all become children of God. And I think that is always important because every single week we gather, we're gonna open up the pages of scripture and we're gonna lean into God's word and how it applies to our life. And just know every single week, we are trying to conform our lives to God's word. We're not trying to conform God's word to our lives. And so that means staring into God's word as a mirror. Which how many of you guys know God's word is so much better used as a mirror than a mallet? We've all seen that done. And when the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And a lot of Christians are running around just hammering folks over the head with God's word where I think we should all just be walking humbly, just saying, God, what do you have in store for my life? And how can I live anchored to the foot of the cross and and anchored to your grace? You know, last week, we jumped into a series called Killing Hostility, and I told you uh, we were gonna be in the book of Ephesians for the next six weeks, and last week we were supposed to jump into Ephesians chapter one, and, and then the Olympics messed up my whole sermon series, and so we are going to jump into Ephesians chapter one today. Uh, I told the congregation last week, I said, you know, this message is gonna put me on a bit of an island, and this past week the, the staff was like, hey, how about we actually put you on a little island uh, in the auditorium. So if you're not at Carmel, I am in a bit of a packing play, and I think it's part of their approach to trying to get me to stay in the same place. But um, this is something we're trying, and we're just excited that you are here. You know, we all acknowledge that we live in, in very unique times, trying times, frustrating times, confusing times. You, you don't have to be a Christian to agree with me on that. The world we live in is shifting. Uh, Communication is becoming more challenging. The issues uh, coming our way seem very new and uh, the ideologies are changing. And how do we engage productively in a way that adds value to society, in a way that edifies uh, and respects the dignity of others as well as honoring God? It's it's a lot. Can I get an amen? And, And how do we do this? How do we understand it? You know, there's this progression that I think we need to be aware of as we look at the world we live in and we think, how do we get here and what is happening? Uh, Here would be some of my take on it. Like we established last weekend, uh, you are fully permitted to disagree with me. That's fine. I'm discovering in this season a lot of people uh, disagree with me, and that's okay. Uh, But we are on the back nine of the modern era. In fact, I would say the modern era has passed and we live in what would be more identified as post-modernity. But the modern era brought all kinds of technological advancements into humanity that has forever marked and changed dramatically the course of human history. Modernization gave birth to globalization. What I mean by that is as technology would advance and things like the World Wide Web and all those things would begin taking shape, suddenly now from the comfort of your own home, you now have access to every leading and competing thought, ideology, myth, or philosophy from around the world. And not only do we have access to all of this information, it all has access to us that because of modernization, there has become this globalization. In many ways, intellectually speaking, the world is getting smaller. I don't know about you, but sometimes the information overload has me feeling a bit claustrophobic. Sometimes too much is too much. And as a result of globalization, we now live uh, in a time of history where Uh, we are marked by pluralization. Track with me on this. Modernization, 
globalization, pluralization. What does pluralization mean? It means we now live in a culture and a society that uh, is being offered every single day a buffet or a smorgasbord of theological concepts and philosophies that you can just pick and choose as you see fit or whatever seems appealing or right to you. And I don't know about you, but I'm not good in a buffet. My dad's favorite restaurant is a place called Golden Corral. Where are my saints at? Anyone, come on, you ever been to Golden Corral? I'm terrible at these places because I go down the line and I don't know how to pair things well. Everything individually looks good on its own and I end up getting back to my table with my tray of food and I've got some fried chicken, some sushi, some chips and salsa, some pudding and a bunch of rolls and together, well, it's just not gonna sit well with me. And this is happening at scale across our culture and society. We, we go through life every single day as presented to us this buffet of beliefs and we look at things independently. Oh, this looks good. I'm gonna put that on my plate. Oh, this looks good. I'm gonna put that on my plate. Uh, most people walk around professing to be Christians are uh, adhering or subscribing to a theology that is completely unbiblical uh, and what happens is, is you get down the road and you realize what you have been digesting theologically and spiritually doesn't sit well with you. And this then develops a bit of a fatigue. Spiritual matters are exhausting to think through. And what you then discover is most people throw in the towel. Most people do not want to put forth the academic energy or the intellectual uh, stamina, a willpower to stay with an idea, to test a philosophy and to meddle on truth long enough to know whether or not you can build your life upon it. Spiritual matters have become too exhausting and the American mind has proven to be too lazy to stick with the conversation long enough to see if it edifies their life. And so as a result of pluralization, uh, we now live marked by secularization. A, a culture that says, okay, the, the spiritual, the, the theological, uh, things regarding truth, things regarding morality, it's too complicated, it's too confusing, it's too exhausting, let's just do away with the spiritual. And so we just subscribe to a completely secularized worldview. Uh, a worldview that endorses and encourages every single one of us to remove God and to place ourselves on the throne of our lives. That is what ego is. E-G-O, edging God out. And th this is what we're doing in our culture. We are edging God out. And I just pray as a community of faith, uh, we can function humbly enough to understand the critical necessity of this God and his will and uh, his saving grace in and through our lives, amen. In the book of Ephesians, Paul is, well, he's addressing the church in Ephesus that in many ways faces some of the same challenges and dynamics that we face. One of the overarching themes to the book of Ephesians is Paul is Early on, and this is first century church in its infancy, uh, is addressing the dynamic and the tension between a church that now is made up of both Jew and Gentile. For the longest time, the people of God and his redemptive work in the world was uh, confined to the Jewish people. God raises up a man who raises up a family, who raises up a tribe, who then raises up a nation, and that nation's name is Israel. And that's the progression of the Old Testament. Jesus shows up, he fulfills all the prophecies, all the promises, and he is the Messiah, the chosen one, and he ushers in uh, grace and redemption to the entire world, including those who are not of Jewish descent, the Gentiles. And so early on in Scripture, in the New Testament, what you discover is there is this tension between people who've always been a part of the faith 
and people who are new and joining the faith, and there's all these different customs and beliefs from the different cultures at play, and Paul is writing saying, okay, we need to bring some unity to the way in which we think and to the way in which we operate and conduct ourselves as believers. And know this, every single week I get up here, it's, it's always a bit of a challenge because when you're putting together a message in the back of your mind, in some way you're thinking, who am I talking to? With this message, who am I addressing it to? And with a congregation the size of ours across 15 locations, uh, there is such a diverse and wide variety of people from all different backgrounds and experiences, uh, some who are Christians, some who are not. Uh, I would say that the majority of this conversation is aimed to those who profess their faith in Jesus Christ who would identify as a Christian. And for those of you who are not a Christian, I think this would be intriguing for you to hear uh, how God's word instructs our lives and the things that we're anchoring ourselves to. And maybe you would be compelled to join a community of faith anchored to such values. But in many ways, this message is directed to the people who say, I'm a Christian. And Paul starts out his letter and he says this in verse two, chapter one. He says, grace to you and peace from our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that statement. Grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you'll find this a greeting, and you'll find this statement all throughout Paul's writings. And it's always in the same order. Grace and peace to you. It's almost a progressing thought that Paul was familiar with, that every single one of us would love to experience the peace of God, but experiencing the peace of God is a byproduct of experiencing the grace of God. That's what Paul would be putting in front of us. Those who experience the grace of God then end up experiencing the peace of God. And every single one of us can relate to the desire and the need for peace within our life. Worry, stress, concern, anxiety, depression, frustration, anger, it, it torments all of us at times. And the question is, is, well, how do we live a life of peace? How do we develop sound mind? And Paul would say, well, it is your experience of grace, the grace that only Christ can provide, that marks your life in such a profound way that it results itself in a peace that surpasses understanding. And that's a, a wonderful thing to consider. What is God's grace? It is his unmerited favor and goodness upon our lives. His unconditional love and constant goodness and presence within our, within our circumstances and along our journey. And maybe what Paul is saying is in, instead of begging for peace, maybe our focus should be basking in grace living every single day aware of the fact that uh, it is only by the grace of God that you and I have any hope, any future eternity. It is only by the grace of God that you and I can be set free and redeemed and forgiven of all of the things that we do to come up short and dishonor God. It is in this grace, this unmerited favor and God's goodness being bestowed upon us that alleviates the pressure and sets our hearts and minds at ease. And Paul starts out and he says, grace and, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Again, our world wants to do away with the spiritual and Paul's saying, no, we are blessed beyond measure spiritually. God has so much in store for us and it, it plays out in a very spiritual way in our lives. To neglect the spiritual is a significant miss. Verse four, even as he chose us in him 
before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now wave at me if you are holy and blameless. Yeah, this is an interesting thing to consider, but what Paul is doing is Paul is placing God's vision for each and every one of us in front of us. He's saying, God has such a remarkable vision for your life. There's more in store. And if you would entrust your life into the hands of this wonderful maker and creator who is also our savior, he would do exceedingly and abundantly more than you could ask, think, or imagine. And he will work all things together for the good of those who trust him. And he will bring to completion the good work that he has started in your life. That scripture, yeah, he places before us a vision. When you go to the pages of scripture, you should sense God casting vision over your life. You should sense the Holy Spirit tapping you on the shoulder saying, you were made for more. That hardwired within us is a capacity for goodness. It's amazing. There is hardwired within us a capacity for goodness. Yet the challenge of free will is though we have the capacity for goodness, we seem very curious to explore our brokenness. One theologian said it this way. He said, we are the one part of creation blessed with the privilege to deny our flowering. The, the sun doesn't wake up and say, ah, no, thanks, God. I'm not gonna rise today. The flower doesn't say, I'm not going to bloom today. The ocean doesn't say, no pretty waves this morning. Every other part of creation wakes up and adheres to the will of God. You and I are the one part of creation that gets to deny our blossoming, deny our flourishing, deny our potential, deny the fact that God seeks to do amazing and astonishing things in and through our life, that he has a vision for you and for me that is marked and identified as holy and blameless. Oh, it's, it's outstanding. This should be a great encouragement to every single one of us, and it should come with a great deal of confidence. God sees something in me that I don't see in the mirror. I'm going to trust him. And he says, the holy and blameless before him, in love, verse five, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us and the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Now, verse eight, watch this statement. Which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Think of the statement. Which he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. That statement seems like a bit of a contradiction because when you think of lavishness or when I think of living lavishly, I don't think wisdom. When we think of lavishness, we think of foolishness, don't we? Who would live like that? Lavishness seems irresponsible, it seems wasteful, it seems careless. We attach foolishness to lavishness. And Paul's saying, yeah, but this is the great mystery of Christ. That in his wisdom and in his insight, he lavishes grace upon us. Truckload after truckload, day after day, he is the ultimate one-upper, and your sin is no match for his grace. God is better at saving than you are at sinning. He just is. And the source of all logic and all wisdom and all reasoning, the brilliant genius behind it all, in the utmost wisdom and discernment and insight said, the wisest thing I can do is lavish grace upon this broken world. 
And maybe we would find ourselves so marked by Christ that we too would discover, oh my goodness, one of the wisest things, most brilliant and insightful things we could do would be to lavish grace on a broken world. He lavishes it upon us in all wisdom and insight, verse nine, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. That at some point, Uh, unity has to become a priority for us. If we are going to reverse engineer our future into our present, understand unity has to be a part of the plan. God's vision is not just holy and blameless. His vision is also a unified people. And have you ever found that you go through life, maybe this is you and your spouse or you and your kids or a roommate, teammate, coworker, whoever, And there there are things that are consuming your mind, but then you engage in conversation to discover there are just very different things on the minds of others around you. Sometimes it's like, yeah, I wish I was thinking what you were thinking. The other day I was driving down the road with Kristen and Kristen said, do you know what would be amazing? To which I was like, what, right? And she said, if I could get the kids to eat chia seed pudding, Like, that's what you're thinking about right now? I'm thinking about how amazing it would have been if Paul never made the statement predestination. Had he never referred to us being predestined because this one statement seems to split the camp in two. If, even if you don't realize it, if you are a believer, you are on one side of this conversation. There are Calvinists, And then there is Armenianism, Calvinism and Armenianism. And I don't have time to go into both camps and unpack them all, but I would say to give you a brief overview of where the two stand on this topic, I think it's important to lay a foundation. For one, a question would be, will there be Calvinists in heaven? Yeah, of course, come on. Everyone's like, I don't know, is this one I should answer? There will be Calvinists in heaven. Will there be uh, those who adhere to the Arminianism view in heaven? Absolutely. So at some point, these two camps end up in the same place on the same team. So let's keep that in mind. In addition to that, if you were to get both camps together and you were to say, okay, what do we mean by predestination? When scripture says he has predestined us, what do we mean? think Paul is referring to. And both groups would stack hands and agree, we believe the word predestined refers to God's foreknowledge. That he is the alpha and the omega, scripture would say, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is all-knowing. He is not only the one who initiates, he is the one who brings it to full completion. And he knows all things. It speaks to his foreknowledge. Well, similar to our culture today, the follow-up question is, well, then how do you define that word? How do you define foreknowledge? And the Calvinist defines foreknowledge as foreloving. In other words, God, before the foundations of the world, chose who he would save and who he wouldn't save, who he would love and who he wouldn't, who would go to heaven and who would go to hell. And ultimately, the Calvinist view is at some point, those who God has chosen in advance will respond to the irresistible grace offered by Christ and they will be saved. That's for loving. The Arminianism view defines foreknowledge as foreseeing. Not that God robotically chose hey, you're, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, but more so that God who knows all things, the beginning and the end, this all-encompassing creator of ours, knows and has the ability to foresee who will choose to respond to the message of grace. 
for awareness, you, you can be a part of both camps and be a part of our church. I would say it may be beneficial for you to understand that myself and the leadership of our church is on the Armenianism side of things. That we personally believe that Christ came to rescue and redeem the world. And anyone and everyone, despite their background, decisions, you know, wayward lifestyles, it does not matter, can repent, come to Christ, and be rescued and redeemed for all of eternity. We believe this grace is available to all people. Amen? But it's amazing because Paul is saying that this God who foresees the end, this God who knew you and I would at some point choose to respond to grace and be adopted into his family before the foundations of the earth. Chapter two, verse 10 says, he predestined us for good works. Now think about this, this idea of being predestined for good works. You and I had no choice as to what time of history we would arrive in. We didn't get to choose the, the, the time, the season. We didn't get to choose the family. We didn't get to choose the culture or the environment. We just showed up. And what is important to think about when you consider that is God has predestined good works, that God knows that what you and I are gonna participate in and the ways in which we're gonna engage with the mission of the gospel in the world well, in the end, it's going to be good. But I think what we have to understand is we don't get to choose our assignment. We do not get to choose our assignment. We didn't get to choose to arrive in this moment in history surrounded by these social dynamics and this strain within our culture. We did not get to say, I wanna address those situations. And I wanna engage in those type of issues. No. We find ourselves surrounded by a world that desperately needs Jesus, and the things that appear as obstacles are, in many ways, our opportunities. And if we would engage, we would discover the very thing Paul is saying. If you would take God at his word and you would remain faithful, you would discover that in the end, that assignment that you're embarking on, it's going to be a good work. So take heart. Take confidence and lean in knowing that even in a, a season like we're in today, even as the world sits in its current condition, God is still on the throne and he is still able to do remarkable things in and through the world and you and I get to participate. It's, it's astonishing. And there are things in this season that to be honest with you, I don't want to talk about. In fact, there are just things that are a lot more enjoyable to talk about, and quite honestly, things that are probably much better to talk about if you're trying to build a crowd. I feel like the stuff that I'm preaching about is like, this is a terrible recipe for building a church. I don't want to preach about any of this stuff. But I, I think we are living in times where there is such a lack of clarity on fundamental things within the body of Christ. We're going sideways and we're lacking the unity we could have if we would truthfully and consistently adhere to the word of God. And this is, this is something we have to consider. Over the last few weeks, I have been in constant uh, dialogue and a recipient of just a lot of information. And as I pointed out last weekend, and we're not gonna belabor it this weekend, um, so much of it has to do with the shifting stance in the church's sexual ethic. This has become the pressing issue on my desk as your pastor. Families and individuals a part of our church are battling this every single day, and there are so many mixed messages out there. In fact, denominations and churches are splitting all across the country because of a disagreement on this sexual ethic. 
And so the, the question is, is, okay, how do we courageously lean in um, so we don't also participate in the unproductive madness that I think dishonors God's will and his word? And Paul is building this idea. Come on, like, we're marked by grace, and God has great things in store for us. And I'm gonna end this, and we're gonna give some thoughts. He picks back up in verse 15. He says, for this reason... Because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might? That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and all authority and power and dominion and above every name, that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all. And Paul is coming to a church and he's saying, I I'm so proud of how you're doing in your faith. I remember you often and I celebrate God's work in your life. And now my prayer is that God would give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation so that you may know the hope to which you are called. Paul is coming to a group of people who are gaining momentum in their faith and he's saying, hey, there's still more in store there's still room for improvement. And we seem to live in times where nobody likes to receive feedback and nobody likes to admit when they're wrong and nobody likes to admit when there's some areas in their life that they could be better at. I, I think the conversations have become so hostile and the relationships have become so tense. Every single one of us is afraid of admitting error because if we do so, we're gonna give up leverage in the situation. So everyone walks around bearing this pressure of acting as if we're perfect and we have everything figured out because we don't want the other side or the other people to know we're still a work in progress. You're still a work in progress. And I am still a work in progress. And much of this faith is leaning in every single day to discover, God, what more do you have in store for my life? You know, a, a weird fact about me is about around the age of 16, I started cutting my own hair. And I'm a little OCD, so I like it cut every two weeks, and my parents were cheap, so they wouldn't take me to the barber shop, so I just figured out how to do it myself, and uh, by the time I got to college, uh, I was opening up shop in my dorm room. I'd do five bucks a cut, and people come by my dorm room, and I'd cut hair, um, and for the longest time, I actually only knew how to cut black hair. I didn't know how to cut white hair until I had two little boys, and uh, they became guinea pigs for me to learn on them. And I have cut my boys' hair their entire life. And still to this day, every two weeks, me and the boys are in the bathroom and I'm cutting hair. And the other day we were out of town and Kristen says to me, babe, the boys just look rough. Can they once just go to a salon and get their hair cut? So I said, fine. So I take them to this place called Sports Clips. Fellas, wave at me if you've ever been to Sports Clips. Okay, this was a fun experience. <laughs> you go in and the whole thing is geared towards guys, especially if you enjoy sports. 
The whole thing is themed out in sports, and there is a package called the MVP. And that means when you sit down to get your hair cut, they put this like shoulder massage thing on your shoulders as you sit in front of a TV playing ESPN. When you are done, they then take you to wash your hair, which side note is the best part of a haircut if you're ever getting it paid for. And while they wash your hair with this tea tree peppermint shampoo that makes it feel like there's icy hot on your head. Is it cold? Is it hot? I feel this coolness. They also put a steam towel over your face. And I'm sitting there, I'm watching my boys go through the deal and we get out to the car and Miles, my 10 year old goes, dad, I was thriving in there. (laughs) Absolutely thriving. I loved it. And have you ever noticed that life comes with a thriving dynamic? You're not always thriving, but there do come moments that somehow you you engage in something that seems to produce a momentum. You experience something that is completely new and opens your eyes to, I had no idea. My sons were like, Moving forward, Dad, you're gonna have to pay us to cut our hair. We're going to sports clips. <clears throat> but anytime we have these experiences, I, I, I'm all often just curious about it. That's, that's interesting to me. God wired humanity to sense and experience and identify when it's thriving and when it's not. Even my 10-year-old son can be like, I wasn't thriving, but now I am. And he has that language, that intuition. What is it in the human soul and in the human mind and our psyche and our senses that somehow is aware of when we're thriving and when we're not? But this is wired in all of us. And what you find when you live a life for Christ, like Paul says, we are blessed in every spiritual way and you start to discover, I had no idea if I would trust God in this area of my life, I could thrive. I had no idea if I would surrender this part of my life, I would generate momentum. But what you start to discover is there's not an area of your life that the grace of God is not sufficient enough to cover. And eventually, you grow in spiritual maturity and a confidence That whatever God speaks to and whatever God touches comes with strength and peace and confidence and momentum. And Christ fulfills his promise that as the author and the perfecter and the finisher of our faith, he came offering abundant life. Life to the full. And my concern sometimes is so many people are going through life forfeiting the abundant life Jesus came offering, the abundant life Jesus died to give us. And I just wonder, what area in your life are you still holding back on not trusting God with? What area in your life is is like, I just don't know if God can work in this situation. And it's become clear to me over the past few weeks, and this isn't the only area this applies to, but one area that has become very apparent to me is there's a growing assumption um, God doesn't have a say in the sex conversation. Well, that's interesting. That that would now be the assumption and that after centuries on end from the beginning of time, God would start choosing his mind, choosing to change his mind now. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but when I go to the store, I'm often confused at the checkout because I pull out my debit card and now there's too many options. You can insert it, you can tap it, or you can swipe it. It's like that old game, bop it, twist it, pull it. Remember that? Aren't all these options even necessary? And now, maybe you've seen this yourself, you can bypass the PIN number. Have you noticed this? I'll be at the checkout and the guy like, just hit the green button, you can bypass the PIN. 
I'm like, that was the one thing protecting me from all you crooks. You can now bypass the pin, the one layer of security. Are all of these options necessary? And are we sure we want to do away with the one layer of security? I think about the sex conversation, and I just think, are all these options necessary? And do we really want to do away with the one layer of security? Folks, when it comes to sexual immorality, there are a lot of things that fit under that category. Quite honestly, we've created a bit of a soapbox out of the LGBTQ community, which I think is an important conversation for all of us to be engaged with. But I think it's a terrible miss for us not to repent and confess that for the past few decades, we have gotten light on our emphasis of purity and living sexually moral lives ourselves. The church has become very accommodating of adultery and sex before marriage and pornography that we have created a snowball effect that we, in many ways, lose our credibility to speak to anyone's shortcomings sexually because we've been ignoring our own. <laughs> Again, I don't want to preach about any of this stuff. But this is, this is the world we live in. And my question for you is, when you think of the sexual revolution that we're living in, do you think we're heading in the right direction? And, you know, I don't want to overdo the Olympic conversation. Obviously, we addressed that last week. But there was one statement made in an interview where the individual who programmed the opening ceremonies was talking uh, just about his country and about their values. And he made this statement. He says, I love my country. And here in our republic, you can love who you want, how you want. And I thought to myself, okay, I respect your pride for your country. Side note, if you check the medal count, my country's better. Uh, but <laughs> in the spirit of competition, Team USA all the way. Um, but let's look at that statement, a statement that would get an amen from culture. You can love who you want, how you want. Okay, let, let's just think critically. God, would you give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation? Does this idea carry water over time? Do we actually think this is good for society? And the individual saying, I love my country because here you can love who you want, how you want, is ignoring the fact that he lives in a country that still prosecutes pedophiles and rapists. Because deep down inside, every single one of us knows, no, there's a line that should not be crossed. And you actually can't love who you want, how you want. I live aware of this every single day. I married a woman who still plays hard to get. But I think, at least for the moment in time, we all agree there's a line that should not be crossed. And the tension that we're feeling is some of us feel like that line has already been crossed, while others feel as if there's still room to play. But again, we all, for the moment, at least agree there's a line. And... Regardless of where you're at, my question would be for you, what establishes your line? When you draw the line, hey, this line should not be crossed, what establishes your line? The other day I was, it was about two weeks ago, in a conversation with an individual who was really passionate about this, this idea. 
and it was kind of a mix between philosophy and theology, and they were, they were just spelling it out for me. And, and I was having a hard time connecting the dots. And I said, where are you getting all of this? To which this individual said, I, I subscribe to this vlogger on TikTok, which I am not here to demonize social media. I'm sure there are wonderful people out there trying to add value and putting out beneficial content on social media. That, that's not my agenda here today. But it did make me think to myself, who would you rather take your cues from? TikTok or the one who made the clock TikTok? Like who would you want to establish your line? And come on, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at the world that we live in and to observe the last four decades of our society to see that this sexual revolution has become the epitome of the snowball effect. Unchecked sexual misconduct has now gained momentum and steam. And so the, the question, again, beyond what establishes your line, would be, what would be the next progression of this sexual revolution? Obviously, we're, we've entered into a new normal where we're experiencing things that we weren't even talking about 30 years ago. If we were to forecast the situation, what could potentially be next? And folks, the writing's all over the wall. It's our children. The thing that for the moment we all agree, hey, there should be a line. We can all look at so many things taking place in our world and be, realize there are people tampering with the line. This is not to say everyone who's living a sexually immoral life is a pedophile. That's not what I'm saying. It's saying there is a progression. And the efforts being taken to reduce the age of children and things that can be done sexually and in terms of their gender while simultaneously eliminating the rights of a parent are, are pretty gut-wrenching to me personally. I, I'm not aware of another group or agenda in the world that is trying to reduce the age. I'm not aware of a group trying to reduce the age for drinking. I'm not aware of a group trying to reduce the age for gambling or for smoking or for, for driving. I'm not aware of a group trying to reduce the age to buy a firearm. But I am very aware of groups adjusting the age and determining what they feel is appropriate for the next generation. And for the moment, I still feel like there is what seems to be a consensus when it comes to underage children, there's a line that should not be crossed. And, and my thing is if, if that is potentially the next, next frontier that this thing is heading into, and we all for the most part agree, that would be the wrong destination. Well, folks, if it's the wrong destination, it means we're heading in the wrong direction. Your direction determines your destination. And if there's any way that we are now approaching the doorstep of the wrong destination, we might want to consider maybe we are heading in the wrong direction. And, you know, it's interesting because there's, there's so much that right now has become a, a point of, of censorship within our culture. And this is happening everywhere. And to be honest with you, there's this part of me that I, I wish I could control the dials of censorship. 
I wish I could determine what information is shared and what information is not. I wish I had that control. But that's a scary game to participate in. Because as we do so, we reinforce this idea that we're all a part of a competition and it's a race to see who gets to control the censorship. Which could be very challenging for us. A couple quotes that I end with. Charles Bukowski, he said this, censorship is the tool of those who have the need to hide actualities from themselves and from others. Their fear is only their inability to face what is real. And I can't vent any anger against them. I only feel this appalling sadness. Somewhere in their upbringing, they were shielded against the total facts of our existence. Richard King said this about censorship. Everyone has an opinion, and the guy screaming for censorship may be the next guy to have his ideas cut off. It's it's a challenge that as much as I wish there weren't all these competing ideas, as much as I wish there weren't all these contradicting ideologies, I will say I remain unwavering in my confidence that once more God's word will prove to be a firm foundation. And the rock of ages, the alpha and the omega, this all-knowing, wonderful God who knows all things, um, well, his ideas are superior. Potter Stewart said, censorship reflects a society's lack of confidence in itself. And I think there's this growing consciousness within our culture that realizes, nah, this isn't working. Something needs to change. And why censor anything? You censor something when you're insecure on your stance because you know that there's a superior idea opposing yours. And uh, guys, I gotta tell you, I, I don't know how much longer in our world that I'll be able to preach about stuff like this and not have it censored and removed uh, from things like YouTube or websites or Facebook. Even last week's message got removed from, for some. I don't know how any of that works. There probably will come a day where unless you show up to a church personally, you may not get to just hear the Bible taught in its fullness. Um, But I am convinced God's words are superior. God's truth is superior. And he's the head. He's the head of all this. And uh, if he takes the head, the best remaining part in the body, I would say, is the heart. And so as we are chasing after the head, I think we should try our best to be the heart to a world that desperately needs the grace of God lavished upon them.